Oh, here we go. Yep, okay. Well, you're on. Yeah, okay, I'm on. I can see myself that I'm on. Yay for me. Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Brent and Sewing. I, I called it the Four Pines Live Show. The Four Pines Live Show? Okay, welcome to the Four Pines Live Show. Yes, because we've been doing like the little reels, so I've been like suckering people into these little 15 second shorts. So you'll notice that our subscri subscription count has gone up a little bit, so... Yay for us! We're working the working the algorithm. The of course, then I got a comment on one of the videos. Are you buying? Are you buying uh, subscribers? Because I didn't subscribe to this, and I'm like, if that happened to you, I'm sorry. No, we don't buy subscribers. Uh, 800 subscribers are hard earned. <laughs> anyway, all that being said, um, check out our calendar. We've got some classes online. Luminaires Owners Club is up. Um, Intro to embroidery is up. We've got the flower patch table runner coming up a week. I think it's next Tuesday already. We still have a couple spots open for that. We may, it's not official yet, but we may be putting the um, Ladies' Day out. Um, the Saturday thing that a lot of people like to do. That might be, that'll be going up here shortly. Oh, Kimberbell Cuties is the 8th. I didn't write any of my dates down. Check our calendar. But there is a Saturday that we've got set aside to do Kimberbell Cuties. It's not really a class. It's more of a social, hey, come hang out, and we're going to muddle through this together type thing. Uh, because Brenda and a few of the others want, uh, wanted a day to work on it, so we just put it on the calendar. If it's something you're interested in, I believe we have a few of the patterns still left. Um, check it out. Sign up if, it, if it's something you want to do. Um, sign up for our emails. I try to get that out every week or so, so you know what's going on. Any questions? So far, so good, right? I think so. Peabody. Okay. I'm just looking at the comments and Gene's like, Peabody. And you know you have that if... I don't have those because nobody's made it yet. They're all going to make it that day. Um, check out, uh, if you go to our website and look, uh, type in Kimberbell Cuties, the book should pop up. It's Cuties Volume 2 because Cuties, the original Cuties is like super old and like hand applique. And so they did a Volume 2, which is all machine applique. But I was just going to say, I was looking at the comments, and uh, Gene said, Peabody Mass. For all of you that are watching from somewhere outside of New England, if you want to come here and make people think that you're originally from here, first off, you have to say your R is really funny, but it's Peabody Mass. It's not Peabody. Like, Wilkes-Barre versus Wilkes-Barr, or Barry Vermont versus Bar Vermont. Just throwing that out there, if you want to know your uh, ge geography. I realized it the other day that I... When I say our, yeah, uh, it's not our, as mo most I think most people so say. would say our instead of our. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's that I. You can blame your dad for that. You <laughs> grew up in New England. Um, yeah, we could go off on all the the different like uh, what's the other one Worcester, <laughs> Worcester Mass. <laughs> See how that one's spelled. Yeah, everybody in Mass pronounces their places weird. Anyway, that being said, I guess we'll get into it. See, and then Rondo, Rondo was born in Bar, 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 Barry, Vermont. Which, if you ever are in New England, just throwing this out there, um, and you're visiting, if you live here, this is also worth check out. I think is it is the Hope Cemetery in Barry, Vermont. It's up in that neck of the woods. The Hope Cemetery is awesome because it's like where all you have all the granite quarries in that area, and it like became a thing apparently for the stone the the granite masons to try and outdo each other when they die. And so it is an awesome cemetery to visit because of all the um, the fantastic headstones, because of just the the artistry that's there. It's really it's a really cool place to visit. If you are ever in the area and want to check something cool out, I would say the Hope Cemetery. Um, if you live in the area, go check it out. It's fantastic. That is a complete side note. I was just reminded of that because of uh, because of our comments about the. Uh, Geography. Anyway, I'm rambling. And you ever listen to those podcasts where people ramble and you like fast forward because you like get to the good stuff? I feel like I've turned into that guy. What we're going to talk about today, I don't know how long this is going to go, but this is something that comes up on occasion and I fell down a rabbit hole. And I've got like notes, like a page and a little bit of notes of this rabbit hole I found, fell down. Hopefully this will jog my memory to remember what I found. Um, fraying fabric. Because a lot of times I will get fabric in and people are like, oh, it frays, so it must be bad fabric. And that got me thinking, is fraying fabric an actual sign or an indication of poor quality fabric? What say you, Eddie? Um, I, I mean, most fabric frays on 
But if it frays more than others, does that mean it's bad? Or a, a lesser quality. I'm not going to say bad. Lesser quality. Uh -huh. Maybe. That's Maybe, yeah. That, that's a popular conception. Um, if it frays, it's lesser quality. Now, I say lesser quality versus bad because when it frays, it is harder to work with. That is one of the problems a lot of people run into is, oh, it's starting to fray and it's a pain in the butt. Oh my gosh, I hate this stuff. So there can be, um, it can be a little bit harder to work with, but the rabbit hole I wanted, the reason I fell down the rabbit hole was, is it lesser quality? Because I try to maintain decent quality fabric in the store. I've had a few, you know, we've tried some fabrics that never make it to the shelf because like, especially like whites, like solids, like white and black are popular because everybody makes a white and black. And um, we've tried different brands when there was a shortage of it and some of it never made it to the shelf because it was just awful stuff. So we do try to have some quality control of what we're putting on our shelves. And so when people come in and say, well, that fabric you sold me phrase, um, Make, made me start to think, am I, is fabric quality going down? Are we selling crappy fabric? So that really bothered me. So I fell down the rabbit hole of why does fabric fray and what does it mean? Um, so let's get into the um, craziness of fraying fabric. There's a few things, I, I covered this a while ago, but I'm just going to kind of revisit a few things. When we start talking about quality of fabric, one of the first things that most people think of is what, Eddie? Um, the feeling? No, if there was a no, number. Thread count. Thread count. You, you follow right in. We didn't rehearse that. Thread count. First thing that most people think of when they, th when they see um, quality of fabric, the first thing they want to talk about is thread count. And that the thread count is, um, is somehow an uh, indication of what is the best, uh, better, better quality. So like you want a sheet with a high thread count because it's super soft. And I'm, what I'm going to tell you right now is thread count doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, do you have that slide that I sent you, Eddie? Let's say I was going to talk about thread count. The one where it's comparing two? Yeah, compare the two thread counts, yes. And this is going to get us into a whole other kind of side thing. I guess we should have talked about warp and weft first about how cool thread. Well, let's uh, okay, don't put, uh, did you put it up, take that one down. Put the, uh, put the other one up first. Because then, or you can put them up together, can't you? I'm like looking at it because I, I, one of our monitors is down. So anyway, thread count is a measure of when you weave fabric. Um, there we go, the weave. They've got two things called the warp and the weft. Um, I believe it's the warp is the... Um, is the is If you're on a loom, the warp is going to be the fixed strings and the weft is the one that they shoot back and forth across. If you've ever seen it done, it's kind of cool. But anyway... And so what thread count is, is if you take a one inch slice of fabric, so I take one inch slice of this fabric, a little one inch square, and I count up how many threads are in there in that one inch slice, the warp threads plus the weft threads, that is my thread count. That's where thread count comes from. So the higher the thread count, means there's more threads in there in that one inch thing. And so people have always associated from the marketing stuff that, oh, higher thread count means, like, for some reason bed sheets came up when I started with a thread count and bed sheets. Um, so now the other thing to keep in mind that quilting cotton, because like I said, fell down this rabbit hole, has what they call a plain weave or an even weave. And this is going to go back to fraying here in a minute, which means that the amount of, Warp threads and the amount of weft threads is the same. If you have 10 up and down, you have 10 across. Um, warp and weft is the same. That's a plain weave or an even weave. And you can get into different counts. That is a whole nother kind of rabbit hole. I started to go down. I'm like, this is beyond the scope of what we want to talk about today. But the different kind of, the different way you weave it gives you different effects. But on the cotton fabric, it's a plain weave, so it's the same. So if you have a hundred, I'll just use hundred because that's an easy one to, to hear. If you have a hundred count thread, that means you have 50 threads coming down and 50 threads coming across. Um, you can see that from the uh, graphic that Eddie has up there, the 300 count versus the 900 count. And this is where it gets interesting. And if you'll notice, disregard the counts on the bottom of there. But what you, the other thing you have to account for when you're thinking of thread count is the thread size. We're going to get into that in just a minute. And I wanted to sh bring up the um, that second graphic there of the thread counts of the 300 versus 900 because that also gets into ply. It's a marketing thing. To get a thousand count thread count fabric, so you've got to get a thousand threads in an inch. 
how thick are those threads going to be? If you stop and really consider that, it's going to be minuscule if you truly did that. So a lot of times what you're running into when you get it like to a thousand counts, they're not counting the actual thread. That is the strand or the pile of the thread because thread is composed of strands or piles, which is oftentimes like two or three. So what they're doing in a thousand count sheet oftentimes is they're saying, well, we've got actually a 300 thread count. But each one of those threads has three strands. So we have 900, thre uh, 900 thread count. It's kind of a cheap way to, to do it. So when I learned this, I realized that the whole thread count thing is just bogus. Um, it's just a marketing thing. But it does have some, but it does have a, uh, it does get into what it, uh, fab, cotton. Because most cotton, most quilting cotton is going to be, 60 to 75 thread count. So what that means is 75 is not even, but 60 is. So what that means, if you're on the lower end of that number, um, a 60 thread count cotton is going to have 30 threads up and down and 30 threads across. And in cotton, in, uh, in the quality stuff that we're using, they're counting the threads, not the strands. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Now, why is that important? Why would a higher thread count... So what you run into is, if you get a higher thread count, you get a denser weave. Now, batiks, typically... Now, this is a big difference between batiks and regular quilting cotton. Batiks often have a thread count of 200 to 220. Um, think about that for a second. The difference between a 60 weight or 75 weight regular cotton versus a two, 200 to 220... It's more than twice as dense per thread. So this is um, aged muslin, which is something that Marcus Brothers does. But it's actually based um, on a batik, what they call uh, the gray goods, is what it's printed on. And this is more of a, uh, I believe this is more of a batik gray good. You can tell from the feel of it and the way that it handles that it's going to be that. So this has a much higher thread count than this, which is a peppered cotton. And we're going to get, I chose these two specifically for a reason. Now, I don't know if you can see from there. But they are both fraying a little bit, which I kind of made that happen anyway. Um, can you zoom right in on that with my dirty, gross, grubby fingers? Do you see this thread right here? Yep. That's one of the threads in the peppered cotton. Compare that to that thread from the um, aged muslin. Can you see that? I don't know if, if it's coming through on the camera. Right up, more. up more, right about there. That difference in thread is your difference in thread count. So the aged muslin is at that 200 thread count kind of batik level, and the peppered cotton is at the 60 thread count, or the regular cotton, um, or the regular cotton strands. So that, so thread count doesn't mean a lot. It's just one number and a lot. The thread size is then another important part. Now, um, and that's, yes, and so I'm just checking my comments. Yeah, that, that's correct, Ron. That's why you hear that pop when a needle goes down in batiks, because one of the things when you're sewing to keep in mind is that when you're actually sewing, you're not tearing a hole through the fabric. Your needle is actually finding the spot between that weave on the warp and the weft and going into, into where there is no fabric. It's looking for the hole. Whereas what you run into with some of the tighter ones, this is why like bed sheets aren't super good to work with a lot of times, and why you'll also get a little bit of a pop sometimes with batiks, is that when you have a really tight weave, the needle doesn't find the space in between the weave, it actually cuts one of the threads. And that's, um, and that's one of the big differences and, and or another reason why you're going to get dull needles when you're working with batiks, because the needle is actually working to cut threads versus find the space in between the threads. So that's one of, that's a, that's a kind of a mechanical difference of the fabric, but that also gives a different feel because you have a thinner fabric um, with the batiks because you necessarily need thinner threads to get a hundred, um, to get a 200 thread count, you need thinner threads than you need for threads to get a, a hundred or a 60 thread count. Okay. Where was I going with this? Oh, we're talking about why does it fray? So one of the things that will lead to fraying, like you'll, if you do work a lot with batiks, you'll notice that batiks don't fray nearly as much as regular cotton, and that is because of the higher thread count. Because it's a tighter weave, it holds your threads in better. 
The other thing that will often lead, and, the, uh, and another reason that a lot of times that, we, that um, fraying is associated with lesser quality fabric is that polyester, a woven polyester, not a printed one, a woven polyester may tend to fray a little bit more of a cotton with the same thread count because the nature of polyester is a little bit slicker, like it's slipperier, right? Slicker's a word, yeah. Polyester, <laughs> like a city slicker. Like a city slicker, yeah. So polyester tends to, from a, um, I got some polyester thread here to show you. If you'll notice, polyester from a, um, just kind of a composite standpoint, is a little bit slipperier than cotton thread. So you can imagine if you've got a weave of the same size, a hundred, say a sixty count, or a hundred, uh, a sixty count cotton and a sixty count poly. The polyester is going to fray a lot more than the cotton because polyester is a slipperier thread. And so a lot of times, that may be, I'm not, like I said, I'm not sure why the, um, where this comes from that because it frays, it's a lower quality. Um, that may be part of it because that a lot of times a, um, a polyester is going to fray more than a cotton of the same count because of the nature, because of the way the fibers are. And that's not to say that a polyester fabric is worse than a cotton fabric. There are places for polyester fabric. It exists for a reason. Um, just in quilting, we tend to not use it. And so we're, so from a quality standpoint, we're like, oh, I don't want to use polyester. I get that. Um, I, yes. I don't like the way boutiques feel. I, I don't either. Does that have to do with the thread count? Yes. Because thread? because it's a tighter thread count, what happens? The fabric itself is gonna be isn't gonna be as soft because you you you've crammed more threads into a finer space, so it tends to be a little bit stiffer. The other reason that you um I, that's not necessarily entirely true. The other reason that batiks tend to be a little bit stiffer, a little bit scratchier, is the production of batiks um causes that. The way that they're dyed and produced makes them a little bit stiffer. One of the things that nobody talks about, and this is a, I don't know if this is a secret or not, but I'm just going to, it's probably not, it's out there, is that what nobody talks about at the end of the day when it comes to cotton, quilting cotton fabric especially is the gray goods. When they say gray goods, that is the blank fabric before it is printed. Um, so to get a quality fabric, you need to start with a quality gray good. Now, I don't imagine, and this is going to get me in trouble, and I'm, this is probably true, like Moda has beautiful fabric. Their fabric feels really well. Because of the gray goods that they're printing on before they get it, you get a higher quality fabric. What you're going to find is a lot of the high-end fabric manu design, fabric manu manufacturers, I guess, because they haven't printed, are probably sourcing all their gray goods. They're all probably using one of three different companies to source their gray goods. Um, because I don't think any of them actually run a cotton farm and create gray goods. They are more about making designs and they're more, fabric companies at the end of the day are more of a marketing company than they are a manufacturing company. Um, but they are sourcing their gray goods. What happens, and this is, is really interesting, is there, is there are proprietary manufacturing things that different manufacturers will use. Like for example, I only know this because um, I've had this happen. Northcott has some really nice feeling fabric. Their fabric feels really nice, almost like silk in the hand, and it's really nice. Well, one of the reasons that Northcott feels as nice as it does is because their finish, they, every, every manufacturer has a different finish that they're putting on it. There's like a silicone little, there's like a, this final finish they put on it gives it that feel. And I have had fabric come through, I had it once from Northcott, and I had it once happen with blank, a bolt come through that didn't get the finish coat. And without the finish coat, fabric feels awful. The fabric was kind of rough in hand and didn't have that nice feel to it that you're used to. Because what you're going to find is you take all of the fabric that you own, you run it through the washing machine enough times, it all starts to feel the same. Because over time, you're going to wash that finish off the fabric, and then you'll get that, it'll feel like it normally does. And so I've had bolts come through that didn't get that finish on them, and you can tell right away they didn't. The quality is still the same. The feel is a little bit different in hand. Um, I don't know that they're doing it as often as they used to, but I do know that there is, like I said, and this is specific to the different manufacturers, what they're doing for that finish coat. That's kind of where you get the difference in feel because a lot of them are using probably the same gray goods because there's only so many people that are making them cotton gray goods um, in the world. Um... Anyway, 
And so that's why batiks will also feel a little bit different because the finish that you put on batiks is a lot different than the regular cotton because of the printing process and how that goes down. So that's kind of a complete side note, Eddie. But any, that's that's important thing to keep in mind about fabric is the finish on it. Because some of the finishes also, because of the way that it's finished, may help reduce fraying. But if you wash it enough times, everything's going to start to fray because it's just the nature of the beast. The other thing that leads to fraying... Have I lost anybody? Any questions yet? Yes, Gene, the finish does wash out. Over time, the finish washes out. The finish is, is there so that it feels nice when I'm trying to sell it. It's... <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the truth of it. Um, but by the time it does wash out, what's nice about it is by if, if your fabric did come with a finish on it, by the time that it does wash out, it's going to be nice, soft, and soft. The idea behind it is to, is to give it that feel of a natural softness that your cotton has after it's been printed because the printing process does make it a little bit stiffer until it gets worn in. Um, let me just see... So yes, sateen is a little bit different. There's actually a different weave. Oh, I thought that was like satin spelled wrong. No, nope, sateen is a different kind of fabric. But that 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 goes back into that warp and weft. If I remember right, this is I saw some of this when I was down that rabbit hole. That the sateen weave is slightly different than a regular weave. But um, sateen, my suspicion, the thread count's a little bit different because if you've worked with sateen, it feels a little bit lighter and it's a little bit lighter fabric, and so sateen is gonna have a the different thread count than your regular cotton. That's the difference when you start looking at kind of quilting cotton versus a sateen, versus a broadcloth, versus, they're all cotton. It's just the weave and the thread count that's different. And each of these different um, categories of fabric have over time kind of found their niche, and so that manufacturing process kind of becomes that kind of fabric. So that's one thing to keep in mind, that, Cotton fabric is a lot of stuff. When I say cotton, that, that's a lot of fabric. Quilting cotton, when you start, when you say quilting cotton specifically, that usually refers to a, um, a cotton that is like, a, usually it's a 60, a 60 count to a 75 thread count, um, a 60 to 75 thread count um, cotton fabric. That's usually quilters cotton. Then like I said, batiks tend, you know, each, each label of cotton fabric has its own, um, Thread count, and the other thing that I wanted to get into is thread size, because this was a whole this was a whole different um, rabbit hole to fall down. But it also had interesting correlations to actual thread, because one of the things is if you have a hundred thread. So imagine we we compared the the two, the two different threads of this and this, right? And we saw how different they were. How would this fabric, how would our um, peppered cotton look if it was 100 count, uh, 60 count, uh, this is probably 60 or 75 count thread, uh, 100, how would that 60 thread count look if it used the same size thread that you have in 100 count, or uh, 200 count? It would look like, uh, it would more almost, spaced out. Yeah, it would be more spaced out. You'd have bigger holes in the fabric. And the other thing that would happen, because you're more faced out, the weave isn't as tight, guess what else would happen? It'd be weaker. It would fray like nobody's business because your fray's, because your, your weave is bigger. Um, it just wouldn't be a good fabric. So that's one of the ways that less expensive fabric is made is they don't use as thick of a thread to weave the fabric. Because if you don't use as thick of a thread, you can get away with less thread. Right? Does it make sense? Now, this brings us to thread weight. Why do we call it thread weight? Because don't we measure thread in length? Right? So I have here, I have a bunch, I just grabbed a bunch of threads. And one of the things I noticed when I started, to, when I was putting this together, I was trying to find out what each of these threads were by looking at the top because after I fell down the rabbit hole, I'm like, oh, well, I already knew a lot of this, but then I was like, started checking all this. The only two that actually have any sort of information about what kind of thread they are is the two Aurifils. The Guterman, which I have here, is just Guterman 100% cotton. That's all it says. These are two embroidery threads. Neither of them has anything about the thread except, I know that the packages will say polyester embroidery thread. We'll say nothing about thread weight. Why do we measure thread and weight? 
Any ideas, Eddie? Um, is it how I always felt like because the it, higher ones, the higher weight are the thicker ones, so it's the amount you can fit in a certain space. Yes, listen to you go. Yes. So basically, there's two ways of measuring thread. Thread weight is, whenever you see thread weight, it's the way that they've measured, that they've decided to measure thread is how a certain length of thread and how much it weighs. And that certain length, because that would be the quantity, that certain length is, can be feet, yards, meters, depends on your measuring system. And how much it weighs, again, could be kilograms or pounds, depending again on how you choose to measure your thread. The most common one that is not used by sewers for some reason, and when I found this out, I'm like, well, this is kind of weird, is the TEX. TEX is kind of an uh, industrial way of measuring thread. And basically what TEX does is how many grams of thread are in a kilometer. Right? So, you say, so that's why it's thread weight. So in the same kilometer of thread, if I have a thicker thread, it will be more grams per kilometer than a thinner thread, right? Because it's the same kilometer, it's just weighs less because the thread is thinner. So that's so as the text measurement goes up, the thread becomes thinner. And this is generally true for most of your thread weights because it's always a, a weight of thread for a given length. Um, I can't remember the um, cotton count is the other is what the more common way for sewers and quilters to write and measure their thread because everybody knows that this is 50 weight and this is 40 weight 50 weight 40 weight that's the cotton count and I can't remember exactly what that is it wasn't as obvious as the text which is um, grams per kilometer because you know you gotta love metric they keep life simple but the problem with cotton count and see this goes back to the original thing we we're saying about a 300 count um, a 300 count fabric versus a th uh, 900 count fabric is that cotton count is the measurement of the strands. It's not the actual thread itself. Did you know this, Eddie? No. no. See, this is what makes Aurifil interesting. That's why a lot of people like their 50 weight Aurifil because it's thinner than a lot of other 50 weights. And do you know why that is? Because if you look on the very end here, can you zoom into this? I'm gonna, I should put my face in front of it because nobody wants to see that. If you look at the top there, there's a little number, I don't know if it's coming through, it says 50 slash two. Do you see that? The 50 is the 50 weight, but that doesn't refer to the thread itself. The 50 refers to the strand. So it's two, the slash two, is two 50 weight strands. So when we say a 50 weight thread, the problem with that measurement when it comes to sewing thread is that this really isn't a 50 weight thread, it's a 50 weight per strand. Um, which is why you'll find, for example, Wonderfill, which we, we, we carry in the store as well, has a 50 weight thread that's a little bit thicker. Because theirs is a 50 weight three strand. Same with the uh, Aurifil 40 weight. Their 40 weight is actually a 42 strand, so it's slightly um, smaller than like a 43 strand. Um, so the cotton count is not the best way to measure thread, but for some reason, like I said, I fell down this rabbit hole. For some reason, quilters have decided that cotton count is how we're going to measure thread. And so all uh, the thread manufacturers responded and give us a cotton count on thread, which brings us to like Floriani. It's a 40 weight polyester thread, right? Yeah. 40 weight based on what? I'm hoping, I don't know, it doesn't say on the package. <laughs> Same thing that I ran into with Exquisite. Same thing. Have you put them like right next to each other? And... Yeah, they're both pretty much the same. Um, the, the thing about the cotton count is it's not as consistent as the text numbers. Um, so if you get a text measurement, you're going to get a much better, uh, more consistent. But what I think has happened in the industry is 40 weight poly. That's your embroidery thread. So they've all decided that, you know, whatever 40 weight poly comes out to. I want to say it's 40 weight three strand on both of these. But that's not going to be anywhere on the package. That's, what's that's what I found interesting about this whole when I fell down this rabbit hole is very few 
very few manufacturers actually have this information on the packaging. You've got to do some digging to find this out. What is it? What is the weight? What is the strand count? So I'm not saying it's a bad thing. <laughs> Trust your local store, but the way that we measure thread in the quilting world is not a super consistent and super, um, it varies, which is fine because the way the hobby is. But if you are looking for precision in your thread, you know, the best thing to do is find a thread brand that you like and know how they're sizing that brand and stick with it if that's an issue. But this brings us back to why does fabric fray again? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's a... Jan, that's a fantastic question, Janice. I don't know. That's one of the things I was trying to figure out because even even the printed stuff on a lot of the spools doesn't even have this information. You've got to go to like websites and stuff. So like I said, one of the things that I would recommend is find a thread that you really like and stick with it. And a lot of people do. A lot of people are like um, like Orophil. A lot of people like uh, Mettler is another very popular one. Guterman is, you know, find that brand you like. It works. Um, that brings us to the other thing that's also, like I said, the thread versus... Fabric thing kind of gets, kind of comes together because fabric is basically woven thread. So a lot of this information also translates over to your fabric. Um, where when they talk about their thread count, well, does is the thread that's in there is it a two ply or a three ply? That's really it's probably irrelevant information, but that goes back to the marketing we talked about earlier because a three ply, you know, you can say it's bigger than a two ply. The other thing to keep in mind is length is the staple. Staple of the, 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 the fiber staple is the length of the fiber. Um, so long staple is three and a half centimeters or an inch and three eighths plus. So any fiber that, so if you have a long staple thread, which is also called the Egyptian and there's a couple other Perel, they've got a couple different names for it, but a long staple threads are going to be, have a longer, uh, the fiber that makes up your strand is a more continuous piece. So if you have a longer staples, you have less length, they run a little bit cleaner. Um, there might be an argument to be made for strength. I don't, I wouldn't get into that, but uh, longer staples run cleaner basically at the end of the day. And for example, I like Orphil because, well, um, it doesn't even say it on here. They used to say it on here. Um, their marketing is the Egyptian cotton, so you know it's long staple. So when you see staple, it's just a reference to the side, the length of the fiber in the, in the strands. And a longer staple is less lint. So that's something to keep in mind. So there's another thing that you could run into with fabric. And this is actually why um, when you start falling down the fabric rabbit hole, if you've ever noticed that flannel is a lot more linty than regular cotton. Just is. And the reason being is flannel uses a shorter staple fiber to create flannel. It's required to get that feel to it. So flannel by its nature is a shorter staple, which at the end of the day means you have a much lintier project if you're working with flannel. Yes, and Gene makes a very interesting point too, just while we're talking about this, that um, people do like to have their specific preferences for thread. But yes, some threads will work better for other projects because of the physics in the, in the thread. That's what's interesting about all this is you start to learn that there are differences and the manufacturing process will also give you differences in the thread. Same as with the fabric is because of the physical differences, they will work better for some projects than others, i.e. flannel. Looks really nice, shorter staple cotton, a little bit lintier, but you're going to want that for specific projects. All right. So all of this thread information translates over to your fabric because that, when you look at your thread count, you know, you've got a, a, a 60, uh, like I said, most of the cotton tends to be 60 count, uh, 60 count quilters cotton. If you've got a nice high quality thread in there, you're going to get a nice high quality fabric. Now that goes back to why my fraying. The fraying, and you're going to see this especially, um, I picked peppered cottons for a very specific reason. We had a lot of this, but we stopped, we kind of stopped restocking because nobody liked it because it frayed all the time. But the reason that this frayed is it's what they call, um, it's, it's a thread dyed. It's not screen printed. What does that mean to be thread dyed, Eddie? They dyed the thread before they... Yes. They dyed the thread before they actually wove the fabric. So if you look closely at this, the warp and the weft... 
the two ways that they go, you know, the, the two different directions. The warp fabric, if you look at the edge here, is um, a lighter purple than the weft. I mean, the, the warp thread is a, little, is a lighter than the weft thread. So any thread dyed fabric that you're going to work with is probably going to fray more because of the way that the threads have been, the threads have been pre-dyed, so they're probably going to be a little bit sl slicker because of the fact they're now dyed. They're not the regular cotton, and then just that whole process is going to give you a little bit more fraying. Doesn't mean it's any less quality, it's just the way that it's, it's been manufactured, you're going to get a little bit of fraying. And then you're also going to see that some of the thicker fabrics, you know, you get a... You get a, a quilting cotton that, like I said, most quilting cotton tends to be 60 count, 60 to 75, but what I've seen is it tends to be 60. A 60 count is going to be a heavy, feel a little bit heavier, but because it's heavier, your weave, it by its very nature, can't be tighter because you can't, you can't make a weave as tight on a, with 50 as you can. I mean, you can't make a, a weave of 40 weight as tight as you can with 50 weight because the strands are bigger. And that's what leads to your fraying is the unweaving of the fabric. So what you may find is some of the nicer, thicker, better feeling fabrics tend to fray a little bit more. It's because of the thicker strands they're using. <clears throat> and again, like I said, it does come back to whatever the, that finish that they put on it because the finish will also to some degree help a little bit. And that's why a lot of people, when they pre-wash, suddenly everything starts to fray. Well, because the finish came off and that was helping. And that brings us to the other point. Am I boring people yet? I seem to be like just going on. <coughs> Does anybody said I'm, I'm out? Nobody checked out yet? I um, right. I think I'm doing all right. Okay. I don't know if I've really answered why it frays more or not. I think all I've proven is that it doesn't mean it's lesser quality, which is really what I wanted to find out. The other thing that you will see, and I don't see it as much, but you will see this in older, um, I think Marty, Marty Michelle was, was good for this. There'll be some instructions that will tell you to cut parallel to the salvage versus uh, perpendicular to the salvage, with the grain or across the grain. That is because the nature of the weft weave versus the warp weave, I'm trying to remember which is which, will give you better results. Because of the way that they're intertwined, one of them won't fray as much as the other, and I had it written down here somewhere and explained why. But because of the physics of how it's woven together, I believe cutting parallel to the salvage will give you less fray than cutting perpendicular to the salvage. Um, and that's just because of the way that the weave goes together. Because when it's being woven, the warp, yeah, the warp, is stationary and the weft gets moved back and forth. So if you cut perpendicular to the, uh, parallel to the weft, you get less fraying because the weft, I don't know, rabbit hole. Like I said, I went way down a rabbit hole. But that is why the practical side of it is you will get less, you should, in a lot of cases, get less fraying when you cut perpendicular to salvage versus, or cut parallel to salvage versus perpendicular to salvage. Cutting width of fabric will give you more fraying than cutting length of fabric, just because of the way that it's constructed. Um, uh, yes, and then we, uh, one of the things to keep in mind, because as we were talking about thread, it did come up, that thicker threads do show up better when you're stitching on top. Um, but that's, like I said, kind of a side note, because we're talking about fabric today, not the thread itself. But, the, but the, like I said, the other reason that quilting cotton is quilting cotton is because it's a little bit thicker. So, so that way you run into, we go back to sateen was something that came up earlier. And this is something I run into, for example, with uh, Michael Miller Fabrics is really good for this. Um, Michael Miller makes fantastic fabrics. I love Michael Miller prints. They've got some really fun prints. What I find interesting about some of Michael Miller's prints, though, is they also have a huge kind of wearables division. They make a lot of stuff for wearables and home decor and that sort of stuff. And what you'll find, some of their stuff, their solids I ran into this with, um, and this is usually, not this isn't specific to Michael Miller, it's just where I noticed it first. But there is a difference in solids that you get, because like for, I'll use Michael Miller as an example, because if you, they, I don't, believe that their line of solids is specifically for quilting they may have changed it's been a few years since i bought it so if you're like a michael miller person don't yell at me don't leave me angry comments i haven't bought their solids for a while because one of the problems i ran into when i bought their solids so many years ago was because of they have a large focus of their um, marketing is on wearables 
their solids tended to be a little bit thinner. There was a, it was a much thinner solid than what you would get from say like um, like a Northcott or a Moda, um, and I and I believe that I'd never you know, again like I said nobody talks about their stitch count but my suspicion is their stitch count was a lot higher on their solids, um, so they're using thinner thread because of the fact that when you're making a shirt or you're making wearables you tend to want thinner stuff versus thicker stuff that's why. Um, when we started, when we decided that we weren't going to carry Michael Miller files anymore, I had a lady come in and buy all the bolts I had because she was a sewer and she focused a lot on undergarments, like um, slips, t-shirts, stuff that's worn underclothing, and she really liked it because it was so much lighter. So one of the problems you are going to find in the quilting world is your solids. This is one of those things. That's a whole nother conversation, but. Keep that in mind when you're buying solids, that not all solids are the same. Some solids, there is, um, for example, I'll use uh, Riley Blake. We do a lot of Riley Blake solids, but they are, which is their confetti line. We have a lot of their confetti solids, but they also have a, a sateen line, which is a little bit lighter. It's not the same as their confetti because the confetti is geared towards quilting. Their sateen is geared towards probably more wearables. And it's a very subtle difference, but once you see it, you're very aware of it. And that's something to keep in mind when you're buying solids at a quilt store is because solids get used in a lot of other stuff, a lot of the manufacturers are using are kind of cross-marketing of them. If a quilt store isn't careful when they're ordering, they may get the wrong solid. Like I said, I had I had the wrong solids for Michael Miller forever. I don't know if they make a regular quilting cotton solid. Maybe they were marketing as that. But that is going to be one of the differences you're going to find in solids is that some of it is developed to be a more general purpose fabric than it is a quilting cotton. So the stitch count might be a little bit higher, therefore a little bit thinner. All right. Have we all learned something today? <laughs> um, well, what's that? Will the thread count on the fabric affect uh, the not screen, uh, electronic printing? The screen printing or the digital printing? Digital printing. Yes. Now, this was another rabbit hole I did not go down. <laughs> I scratched the surface, and I'm like, okay, we're going to stop there. One of the other interesting things about the fabric thread count is, like I said, the thread count is also associated with, um, is also closely associated with the size of the thread. If you have too much space between your threads. So if you have a low thread count with a thin thread, you're gonna have a little bit more space in your grid. And what will happen is it will take more ink to dye that fabric because you've got to fill up that air pocket and it gets filled with ink. So what we'll end up with in some cases is a stiffer, coarser fabric because the thread count was lower and to get, the prop to get it printed properly, they had to use more ink to, to to fill the holes, so to speak. So that was, all, like I said, I just scratched the surface of that, but there is, um, the quality of the print itself is related back to, like the quality of the, the, the printed surface, like the final print, is related to the quality of the underlying gray goods. And you, and you technically would need to use more ink to print a lower quality fabric, <coughs> which I don't know how the math works out on that, which is also a reason why sometimes you might find low quality fabrics to have so-so prints on them because they probably skimped on the ink as well. So that is um, that is a uh, something to consider. Um, and now how that relates to digital, like I said, I didn't go way down that rabbit hole, which I probably could have, but I didn't because we're already 45 minutes into this and I didn't even get into the printing stuff. But I do suspect that there is an aspect of digital printing that is related to the gray goods for better quality because that is something I have been noticing as... Digital printing is becoming more and more prevalent. I have noticed that the the shot the the manufacturers that are kind of focusing more on digital prints are using a finer fabric, which would indicate probably a higher stitch count, which would make sense because you have a closer weave, which would probably give you a better digital print. This is an assumption that I have, and I could be wrong. So if you know otherwise, put it in the comments. And tell me I'm wrong, but I do suspect that as we see more digital prints, we might, but we might find that the um, stitch count may go up a little bit on this some of this fabric to get better digital prints. Because one thing I have noticed um, is that the the really nice digital prints that I am seeing 
tend to, um, I, I, my suspicion is they're using different gray goods because they have a, a little bit different feel than a regular cotton screen print. But again, don't quote me on that. If you happen to be a Fabric Insider and you have better knowledge on that, I would love to hear from you because um, the digital printing thing is fascinating to me. Um, just checking the comments real quick. Uh, Janice has a question about Kona. Oh, I could talk about Kona, but I don't know if it's going to get me hate. <laughs> One of the problems, Kona is like Q-tips. Because, are all Q-tips Q-tips? No. No, they're usually cotton swabs. But because Q-tips did an awesome job branding, we think all cotton swabs are Q-tips. So anytime you have a swab, you're calling it a Q-tip. Um, Kona is very similar to this. Kona was, did a fantastic job of establishing themselves as solids. So whenever somebody asks about Kona solids, one of the problems we have that I see in the quilt industry, so I have somebody coming off the street and says, I need some Kona solids, which is to say they need solid quilting fabric. They don't necessarily need Kona. So it's a, so keep that in mind if you're looking for Kona solids or somebody says, I need some Kona black or some Kona red. It might not be necessarily Kona solids. It could actually be just solid quilting fabric. This is something I run into a lot when somebody says, I need Kona. We, I've had, I think I've got, I don't even think they're on the shelf anymore. We've had like three bowls of Kona in here, but people love our solids. One of the issues I have run into with Kona, and this is something I've tried to confirm, and this again could be internet rumor or whatnot, is I don't think... Um, well, Kona is made by Kaufman, if I remember right. Kaufman makes awesome fabric. So don't, what I'm about to say is not to badmouth anybody. But one of the things that I have run into with Kona from a store standpoint is I'm not sure that the consistency and quality is there. And my suspicion, and this is just my suspicion, and I'm not sure, I haven't been able to confirm it. The internet is awash in rumors. So when I, you know, Google it, maybe I should ask the new AI thing. Maybe the AI would know. My suspicion is that Kona is actually has two tiers of solids because I can go over to Hobby Lobby and buy Kona. I can also order Kona from the store. And I do know that in the past, I've the problem I've run into with Kona is there's a there's inconsistent quality. And my suspicion is they've got a quilt store, independent quilt store quality, and then they've got the mass market quality that they ship out to like Hobby Lobby, Michaels, and Joann's. And I think what has happened the few times that I've had inconsistent quality issues is they pulled it off the wrong pallet from the quilt stores <laughs> and sent me the, the Hobby Lobby version versus the quilt store. I could be wrong. So don't quote me on that. Don't send, you know, if that is, um, if that is, you want to send me some hate mail, feel free to, to set me straight on this if you work for Kona or know any, anything more about this. But one of the reasons we don't carry Kona in the store anymore is the inconsistency in quality. And like I said, I think it has to do with how they've branded themselves. Um, and they make, you know, for the price point, when you go over to Hobby Lobby to pick it up, it's not bad stuff. But there are better solids out there than Kona. Um, well, I say that if you get the good quality Kona, it's as good as the other stuff. But the problem I have been running into from a store standpoint is ensuring that I'm getting the quality stuff. And so what has happened is, like I said, Kona has done such a great job of this because of their where they're at everywhere that people say, I need Kona solids. When I can tell you that Moda Bella solids are going to be as good or better than Kona in a lot of cases. Um, Riley Blake Confetti Cotton, which we carry, is really good. Um, we've also got a lot of the North Cot um, cotton solids. Every major manufacturer has a good cotton solid for quilting. One of the things you run into is, like I said, with Michael Miller solids, is I think that one of the, and you see this, again, with Riley Blake, this is the same issue, is if you order the sateen line of solids versus their confetti line, they're two different fabrics. So they're, they're kind of meant for two different markets. And so you may see that as well with other manufacturers, like, you know, for sure. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when you're buying solids. And for somebody to say Kona solids, and I just went on for, Five minutes about that. <laughs> I apologize. But keep that in mind. If you are looking for Kona solids, you're really looking for quilting solids. And um, and I'm not saying that Kona's bad. Like I said, Kona makes some good stuff. They like, Again, like a Q-tip, they are the, their marketing is so good that they became solids. But keep in mind, there are lots of other alternatives to Kona that um, at an independent shop are going to be a little bit more consistent for quality. Um, and then price also plays into that because sure you can get some call 
some solids at eight bucks a yard versus other solids at nine or ten bucks a yard, and that's going to go back to you know in the store. But also, you're going to find what we find on the on the wholesale side. There is I've seen a, a fluctuation in solids as much as 50, 50 cents to a dollar per yard on the wholesale, which is why you see that on the retail side. And it just comes back to what you're looking for. And um, that's why I think a lot of times you'll find sateen, for example, on a quilt store's floor. And sometimes that's more of an accident because some of those other um, solids, not meant for quilting but more for wearables, do come in a little less expensive. So you will see more, um, so shops will tend to pick those up because of that without, and it's not a fault of the shop. It's just a matter of uh, experience where they learn, you know, because of our early days, I had Satine on the floor before I learned about it, the difference. Um, not bad stuff to work with, just um, something to keep in mind. Um, all of that to talk about solids, Kona. Um, I don't know if I've answered the question of why does fabric fray? <laughs> <laughs> or is fraying bad? At the end of the day, like I said, I found on this rabbit hole. I just wanted to share it all with you. Fraying is not necessarily a, a sign of um, low quality fabric. It's just the difference in how it's manufactured. Um, Google how to stop fraying because I, when I was trying to find it, find the engine to this, I, everybody talks about how to, to stop fraying. Nobody talks about why it frays in the first place. Fray check is a great way to go. Starch the crud out of it. A lot of people pre-starch a lot of stuff. Um, I tend to not pre-wash. That also... Pre-washing encourages fraying, not pre-washing saves the you from fraying. But there's a few different ways to keep it from fraying. But don't let the fra don't confuse fraying with the quality of the underlying fabric because what you're gonna find is that may keep you from using a lot of really good fabric. Like I said, peppers peppered cottons are a fantastic fabric. I love the way these feel because of the process they're made. But I think the reason that it's so soft and it's so awesome also is one of the reasons why it frays. So um, I hope you all learned something. And I was going to just do tension because somebody had a question about how to set tension on a machine. We'll probably do that next week because this took way longer than I thought it was going to take. But, yeah, fraying. I don't know if I, like I said, I don't know if I answered the question, but I hope you all kind of got something out of it. Um, like, subscribe, and all that stuff. Um, and we'll keep having some fun. Um, yes, Kona does have a lot of colors. Uh, yes, Moda also has a lot of color. Bella Solids is another really good one if you're looking for solids. I should get more of those in the shop too. I like them. But anyway, all that being said, I appreciate you all watching. Thanks for watching. So on. And be excellent to each other.